Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on a subject that I've entitled Killing Sacred Cows. I'm dealing with a number of different things. This week I've been talking against the wrong teaching on the sovereignty of God. But I've got this series that deals with five different religious doctrines that just make the Word of God of none effect. Mark chapter 7, verse 13 says that you make the Word of God of none effect through your tradition and doctrines of men. Probably every person watching this program would say, oh yes, God's a good God. And if I said, do you believe that God loves you? Oh yes, God loves you. But are you receiving the benefit of that that you should? If we really just understood the love and the goodness of God, all of your problems would be over. And yet there's many of you who'd say, oh, I know that, and yet you still got problems galore. The reason is because religious traditions and doctrines of man have negated these truths and have diluted them and taken the power out of them. And what I've been talking about this week, I've been talking against the sovereignty of God. And I've spent all week long trying to deal with this, and I know that there's people that are immediately offended because you just... This is unquestionable. This is a foundational doctrine that God is sovereign. God controls everything. I'm not against God being sovereign in the sense that He's absolute authority and power. He's first in rank, order, and authority. He's independent. We can't force Him to do anything. I agree with all of those things, but I am against the religious doctrines that teach that God controls everything, that He either originates it or has to give permission to Satan to do something in your life. That is a doctrine of the devil, and that is not what the Word of God teaches. I know somebody, if this is the only program you've watched this week, you may just be shocked what I've said because it's so contrary to so much evangelical Christianity. But I've, I've dealt with a lot of things from James and from Romans, uh, John 10, 10, just many, many scriptures. I've already dealt with a lot of this. Let me go to some other scriptures that I've heard people quote before. Look at this in Psalms chapter 78 and in verse 49 talking about how that the Lord delivered the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and how He brought these plagues upon the Egyptians. It says in verse 49, He cast upon them the fierceness of His anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Now see again, I don't have a problem with what this verse says. I'm fixing to explain it in a minute, but people have made it say things it doesn't say. They say evil angels. God used demons. God sent the devil. God is the one who's controlling the devil. The devil couldn't do something if God didn't allow it. That is not what that says. Look at another verse over here in Isaiah chapter 45. And in verse 7 it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all of these things. And people have made that verse say things that it doesn't say. That See right here, God creates evil. All of the evil in this world is created by God. That is not what it says. You know how you can simply answer this? How, and there's other scriptures. I'm just picking on a couple that I've heard some people misuse and twist and pervert. Here's a real simple answer. Look at this in Jeremiah chapter 24. The Lord showed me, and behold... Two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad." Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, The figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. And then the Lord went on and He used this as an illustration to teach something to Jeremiah. But here's the point I'm making right here. In this third verse, He says, What do you see, Jeremiah? And He says, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that could not be eaten, they are so evil. So he called these figs evil. Does this mean that they were demonic? That this, does this mean that they were demonic figs, demon-possessed figs? No, it's obvious. It even uses the terminology up here that they could not be eaten. They were so bad at the end of verse 2. 
Did you know if you look the word evil up in the dictionary, it just, one of the definitions is bad. And in the Old English, in the King James, you know, sometimes the words have changed over the centuries, and we now use the word evil nearly always to refer to some kind of a devil, demonic type of thing. But the word evil just means bad. So when they sent evil angels among the Egyptians, these weren't demon spirits. They were angelic, godly spirits, but they accomplished a bad thing. They brought plagues. They turned the ground, the dust into lice. They turned, frogs came up out of the river, turned the water into blood. Hail fell out of the sky. Fire ran along upon the ground. There was darkness. And then the, the firstborn were killed by a godly angel not by a demonic angel. He didn't send a demonic angel. It was a godly angel. And then over in Isaiah chapter 45, where he says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This evil isn't talking about he creates demonic stuff. He, he's the source of all evil. It's just saying that when he creates light, that means anything that's not light is darkness. When he creates peace, then anything that's not peace is evil or bad. He's the one that says, this is good, this is bad. God is not the one who creates evil in the sense that he causes evil. He just created, when he says, this is good, then automatically the opposite of that is bad. For people to take these verses and to teach that somehow or another God is the source of all evil, that in itself is evil. To credit God with all of the mayhem, the rape, the murder, the perversion, the homosexuality, if you're going to believe that God is sovereign and if you use it in the way that I'm teaching against this extreme sovereignty, well, then God is the one that makes everybody a homosexual. God's the one that makes everybody commit adultery. God's the one that makes everybody murder. God's the one that creates all the jihadists that are killing people and terrorizing people. Are you going to blame God for beheading Christians? and say that, you know, all things work together for good, that God caused this, it was God's will that these Christians be beheaded. Of course not. Man, you have to be religious. You have to be blinded to be able to operate in that kind of stuff. God is not the source of all of this evil. You know, you could turn over to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 16, and in verse six, chapter 16 and 18, it talks about an evil spirit from the Lord came and afflicted Saul. And I've heard people take that and say that God used some kind of a demonic spirit to afflict Saul. No, God doesn't use the devil. God and the devil are not in, in cahoots. They are not helping each other. The devil is not helping God. He is fighting against God. He's rebelling at God. But it says an evil spirit. It was evil, again, is used in the sense that Jeremiah 24 is talking about. It was evil in the sense that it produced something bad. This was a godly spirit, an angelic spirit, but it was afflicting Saul with punishment. He had rejected the Lord and God was tormenting him. Somebody says, well, that's terrible. So you're saying that God torments people under the old covenant. You know, let me just go back and and say that this book that we're offering as a complement to what I'm teaching here, this would answer this in a lot more detail than what I have time to do here. But there was a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And in the Old Covenant, God did smite people with sickness, with disease. And in this instance, Saul, he punished him because Saul had become evil. He actually got to where he was worshiping and going through a witch and doing things to uh, draw up Samuel from the dead. And Saul had become rebellious, and there was a godly angel that was persecuting him and tormenting him. And somebody says, so God does that. In the old covenant, he did it. But in the new covenant, we have been redeemed from all of this. All of our punishment, all of the wrath of God against sin has been placed upon Jesus. And God is not going to afflict people like this today. But under the old covenant, he, like for instance in Numbers, Miriam and Aaron, they came out against Moses because he had married a black woman. He married an Ethiopian woman and he was like a Jew. He was a, you know, kind of an olive complexion or whatever, you know, that Middle Eastern 
uh, complexion. And so it was an interracial marriage and they criticized him and they tried to take over the leadership and said, God hasn't only spoken by you. We're also prophets. God can use us. And they tried to take away the leadership of the children of Israel from Moses. And you know what happened? God smote Miriam with leprosy. It says God smote her with leprosy. The same thing happened to Uriah, one of the kings, and, uh, or excuse me, Uzziah, one of the kings. And he went into the temple and he offered a sacrifice. Kings could not step over into the ministry of the priest. And the priest withstood him and said, don't do it. It does not appertain unto you to offer this sacrifice. And yet he pushed him out of the way and he offered this sacrifice and God smote him with leprosy. So God did that, but it wasn't wrong. It was just, he was sinning. God hit people with things, but here you will sometimes hear people that are into this sovereignty of God teaching and blame God for everything. They will quote these Old Testament examples where God smote people with leprosy and things like this. A death angel went out and killed 186,000 Syrians in one night during the time of Hezekiah. And they will say, see, God's going to do these things. God's punishing you. God's doing this. In the Old Testament, God did those things because Jesus hadn't come and redeemed us from the wrath of God. That's what this book is about. Man, I encourage you to get this book. The war is over. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, the angel saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. People take that as saying peace among men, but that's not what this is saying. Matter of fact, Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 10, don't don't think I'm come to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. A house is going to be divided, two against three, the father against the child, and etc. Jesus didn't come to send peace among men. This was talking about peace from God towards men. God placed our punishment upon Jesus. John 12, 32 says that if he be lifted up from the earth, he will draw all men unto himself. The word men in the King James is italicized, showing you it wasn't in the original text. It literally says, I will draw all unto me. And they just assumed it must be talking about man. But if you put it in context, verse 31 and 33 are talking about Jesus dying on the cross and drawing all of God's wrath and judgment unto him. All of God's wrath came upon Jesus, and God isn't smiting people under the new covenant the way that he did under the old covenant because Jesus came and ended the war. He he took the wrath and the punishment of God, and we are not being judged by that like that today. So in the Old Testament, he sent evil angels, not demonic angels, but just godly angels that were bringing punishment upon the Jews. He sent an angel to punish Saul. He smote Uzziah when he tried to offer this sacrifice. But none of those things were blessings. They were curses. They were under the curse of the law. If a person didn't live godly, then the wrath of God came upon them. But in the New Testament, we've been redeemed from the curse. Let me read this to you out of Galatians chapter 3 in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So this says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? The curse of the law is that if you sin, instead of the blessing coming upon you, the wrath of God comes upon you. And so there were times that God sent angels. You could say evil angels, as in Psalms chapter 78, verse 49, but they weren't demonic. They were just godly angels bringing wrath and punishment upon people because of their rebellion and rejection of God. But under the New Testament, God is not going to do that to us because Christ redeemed us from bearing punishment and curse. You know, over in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this is the most literal fulfillment you can get of Galatians 3.13. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, lists the blessings of keeping the law. Verses 15 through 68 list all of the curses that will come upon you if you don't keep the law. 
And for those of you who aren't very good at math, let me just point out that verses 15 through 68 are more numerous than verses 1 through 14. There's more curses than there are blessings. And the blessing was totally dependent upon your performance. In Deuteronomy 28, it says, uh, it shall come to pass if, that makes this all of these promises conditional upon performance. It shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. Now, some people see, will teach, oh yes, you've got to live godly in order for God to move, but you can't be perfect. Just do the best you can and you know, God grades on a curve. Maybe you don't make 100%, but if you were in the top 10%, God will round it up and you pass. No, this says you have to observe to do all of the commandments. And if you don't observe to do all of them, then instead of the blessings of verses 1 through 14, you get the curses of verses 15 through 68. Now, this needs to be interpreted in the light of the New Testament because, again, Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. You cannot get any more literal fulfillment of the curse of the law than Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68. Christ redeemed me from this. And the way that the New Testament believers should read Deuteronomy 28 isn't to say that if I observe to hearken diligently and observe to do all of these commandments, then these blessings will come. But here's the way the New Testament believer should read Deuteronomy 28. And they should say, it is coming to pass since Jesus hearkened diligently to observe and to do all of the commandments. And since I have put faith in him and I am now joint heirs with him, that all of these blessings are coming upon me and overtaking me because of what Jesus did. And then when you get down to verses 15 through 68, and it says all of these curses will come upon you, the New Testament believer can read this by saying that these curses will not come upon me because Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13. And you can read everything that's written as a curse and turn it into a blessing because I'm redeemed from this curse. The blasting, Mil blasting is a damaging high wind, such as a tornado or hurricane. I can rebuke those things. I'm delivered from those. Those aren't for me. Mildew is a curse. And the botch and emrods and all of these other things that I don't even know what they are. And over in, I believe it's in verse 60, it says, Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of the law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. So this is talking about every sickness and every disease. Even if they weren't, uh, you know, functional back in those days, if we have AIDS today, if we have some kind of a new strand of Ebola and all of these kind of things, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything, even if it's not written in the book of law, any sickness, any disease is a curse. I'm redeemed from it. You know, it's just like if you had a big board here in front of us. And if on one side you wrote blessings and on the other side you wrote curses and then you put a line down the middle. So over here, Genesis, I mean, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 are the blessings. And blessings here, and let me just read some of these. These are the blessings that'll come upon thee. In verse 3, you shall be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Verse 4, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. That would be like your wallet, the money you have on you, and then your bank account, savings account, where you store the rest of it. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. You're blessed coming and going. It doesn't matter which direction you're going. You're just blessed everywhere. In verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Every one attack that comes against you, they are going to flee seven ways. You're going to be have seven times greater blessings than whatever somebody tries to come against you. In verse Eight, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. He will establish you a holy people. You'll lend unto many nations. You shall not borrow, etc., etc. So again, remember, you got blessings over here, curses over here, lying down the middle. These are the blessings. Health, prosperity, victory, joy, peace, 
These are good. These are blessings. And then over here, curses are sickness, disease, anguish, depression, discouragement, the botch, mildew, emrods, blasting, on and on and on. All of these things are listed as curses. And yet sovereignty of God teaching today has turned this around and said, oh, being healed and believing that God heals today, that's of the devil. This is over here on the curse side. It's a, it's a curse to be well. It's a curse to have prosperity. Prosperity is of the devil. And they list all of these things as curses. And then they put over here sickness, blasting, mildew, emrod, suffering, pain, sorrow. This is all of God. It's perverted. It's wrong. I'm telling you, God is not the source of your sickness and disease. Man, how clear does it have to get? You know, I'm just appalled at the way that people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They've been taught this, and they just believe that God controls everything, and they aren't going to use their head for anything but a hat rack. They don't think about it. They don't look at it. It, it would, doesn't make sense to think that God is the source of all of these things. He makes people evil. He causes them to murder, rape, plunder, and then He's going to turn around and judge them for what He made them do. It doesn't even make sense. I'm telling you, God is not the source of our problems. Boy, it is just so clear. But sad, most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. You know, I was painting a house one time, and this woman was a Baptist, and I told her I got kicked out of the Baptist church. And she says, why? We need people like you in the Baptist church. And I said, well, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she says, what are you talking about? Are you talking about speaking in tongues? And I said, well, that's part of it. But I said, there's more to it than that. But yeah, I spoke in tongues, and the Baptist asked me to leave, kick me out of the church. She says, they'd have kicked you out of my church too. So I turned over to 1 Corinthians 14, 39, where it says, forbid not to speak in tongues. I said, right here, it says, and this woman just stopped me, and she says, hey, there's lots of things in the Bible that we don't believe. <laughs> and when she said that, I mean, how do you talk to a person when you, they don't respect the authority of the Word? They're going to believe what they believe, and they don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. I pray that that's not you. I pray that you would reject this weird abnormal, extreme teaching on the sovereignty of God. I've got this teaching entitled Killing Sacred Cows, and, and I could say a lot more. This book will go into a lot more detail on what I've talked about, but today's going to be my last day to talk on this first point about the sovereignty of God. So please request these materials. Listen to our announcer as he gives you all the information, and please call or write today. <laughs> 